equip such an agent with two recurrent neural networks. One is the controller and the other one is the model. The controller just sees the incoming stream of perceptions, video, audio and so on and translates that into muscle movements, into robot control commands which make the robot move and shape the incoming inputs, the history of incoming inputs. The other one is a world model. The model of the world is a prediction machine which tries to predict what happens if I do that and that. Over time, the prediction machine looks at all the data that is coming in, all the actions that were executed, all the perceptions that came in, and tries to find regularities in these data. And regularity detection always means better prediction, better compressibility. Whatever you can predict well, you don't have to store extra because you can predict it already. Which means that if you have a long data sequence, say a video of 100 falling apples, once you can predict these falling apples because you understood gravity, you can greatly compress the, the sequence of incoming data. And all of science is about that. All of science is about finding simple rules behind the observations. Now, we can measure the depth of the inside of a learning network by looking at how many computation resources did it require before learning took place and afterwards, when it discovered the regularity. And the difference between before and after, that is a number. And that's the fun that the network has which is a reward signal, an internal joy signal, which goes to the controller. And the controller is wired up to try to maximize all the expected reward until the end of his lifetime, which means it is trying to change its internal connection such that it becomes better at translating the incoming inputs into action sequences or experiments that lead to even more data that has the property that the world model, the model still can learn something about the world that it didn't know yet. And now the controller is motivated to come up, to invent experiments that improve the world model, just like a scientist is motivated to come up with new experiments that improve his understanding of the world. Maybe he comes up with a new data sequence generated through an experiment and he hopes there is a previously unpublished physical law in there. And if he's, if he's lucky and if it was a good experiment, then his dream comes true. And he has a lot of joy and excitement and fun as this is happening. And we can build artificial agents that do the same. It is true that um, recently many philosophers and entrepreneurs and physicists and other people who don't know too much about AI have warned about the dangers of AI. Few people make AIs, many talk about them. Many science fiction authors also have warned about the dangers of AI. Whenever I I'm meeting one of uh, these guys, I'm trying to calm their fears, pointing out that there is much older, 50-year-old technology which can destroy all of humankind within two hours without any AI, and that's H-bomb rockets. And people forgot that after the end of the Cold War, although we had a dramatic... Um, reduction of nuclear warheads, we still had more than 10,000 of them and we need just a few hundred to, to devastate the biosphere and to make civilization as we know it impossible. So we already have reached many years ago the maximum level of self-destruction capability and we don't need any AI for that. Within two hours, this planet can be made uninhabitable. Many people forgot that a single H-bomb has, has more destructive power than all conventional weapons on this planet combined.
Yes, of course. Um, so at the moment what I'm seeing is that uh, even journalists in Europe, when they do research about AI, what they do is they go to um, blogs in Silicon Valley, which are written as if this stuff was invented in Silicon Valley. Of course it wasn't. Much of that stuff, deep learning and so on, um, was developed by Europeans and it started 50 years ago when this mathematician from the Ukraine, Iva Knenko, built the first deep networks in the 60s. Uh, he was the father of this field of uh, deep learning. And then uh, in 1970 there was a Finnish guy who um, invented a widely used method which is called backpropagation, which is used to train uh, deep networks of today. And then in the beginning of the 90s, there was my first student, Sepp Hochreiter, who identified a problem with that method because it doesn't really work well when the networks are really deep and powerful. So um, we had to overcome that. And then we devised um, a whole bunch of methods for solving that problem and we overcame it through methods that are now widely used uh, by the world's most valuable companies, which are not sitting here in Europe, but in, uh, in the United States and in China and in other places in Southeast Asia. Just do the proper research and not only uh, copy what you find in uh, blogs in, in Asia and in, in uh, Silicon Valley, but just look uh, next door what happened there and um, how can you um, uh, communicate and represent that in a good way. Well, that's your job. You are communication engineers. Mm -hmm.